First up is the Pet Mimic. To get the Mimic as your Spore Servant, you need to head to Moonrise Towers. Once you get to the top of the stairs, go past Balthazar's room to eventually find a curious treasure chest that actually turns into a Mimic when you get too close. Slay it and then pick it up. Now in order to do this, I had Karlak wear the Mighty Cloth, which grants plus two strength and doubles your carrying capacity. I also drank an Elixir of Hill Giant Strength for good measure. After emptying Karlak's inventory, she was able to pick up the Mimic. Then it's as easy as teleport to the Myconid colony and have Glut use animating spores on your new Mimic pet. You can also use these spores on Nulls. The newly born Null weighed the least, so I dragged his corpse down into the Underdark to offer it up to Glut. As he breathed new life into the corpse, it began to float and glow a sickly green, and I really wasn't sure I was the good guy anymore. Then I was convinced I was the bad guy when I commanded the Null to tear off its ear and use it as a throwing weapon. You can even use these spores on the Harpies in the Emerald Grove. You'll need to slay them and carry their corpses to glut, but these are pretty light, so you shouldn't need much strength. They actually keep their luring song ability, which is pretty cool, but the music doesn't play when you use the ability, which is a bummer. And the harpies are also missing quite a few animations, such as climbing, so they kind of just glide down ladders in this weird squatted position, kind of like they're taking a dump. You can also use these spores on the Gramishka in the Rosymorn Monastery, but sadly they do not keep their magic allergy as a spore servant, which would have been really, really cool. So it's kind of just like a cat familiar with a much stronger bite. Also, it doesn't have fur if you ever wanted a furless cat pet. And you can even use these spores on the Edder Caps, which wins the award for the grossest pet I think I've ever seen in this game. As if the Edder Cap wasn't gross enough in life, in unlife as a spore servant, this monstrosity truly earns that label. It can shoot webs, multi-attack, and ice skate? Yep, when the Edder Cap tries to sneak, he actually breaks out his ice skates and glides around. And you can use these spores as well well, on wargs, there is one small one named Claw at an outpost right before the goblin encampment. Being lighter than other wargs is perfect since we need to drag his corpse to glut to reanimate, and the other wargs are too heavy. The undead warg looks incredibly gross too, and just has bite, so really not the best spore servant, but very nearly the grossest looking. And of course, it's widely known you can also use these spores on the belay. This massive monstrosity creature burrows and emerges periodically while you are in the underdark until you you slay it, and this is one of the best creatures to use animating spores on because of its massive health pool and high damage. You can also use the animating spores on all of the phase spiders, from the smallest ones to the biggest one, and all are considered monstrosities and can be animated as your spore servant. The phase spider ethereal jaunt is a really cool looking ability to help it get into position. You can also use the animating spores on the minotaur, found in the underdark as well. These massive monstrosities have really cool art and are definitely up there in terms of good choices for for animating spores. And last, you can also use animating spores on hook horrors. These can be found near the Seusser tree in the Underdark and are quite powerful too, able to knock enemies prone and then use multi-attack on them for burst damage. But if you like that tip, don't forget to smash that like button and subscribe for more Baldur's Gate 3 videos. Number two is a collection of weapons you're not supposed to be able to get, but are really quite strong if you do. My personal favorite and first up is the Twisted Oak Crook. The Twisted Oak Crook is actually an incredible weapon. Now, it doesn't even say this on the weapon tooltip, but it actually will ensnare your target on hit. Ensnare makes it so that the affected entity cannot move and attack rolls against it have advantage. There are lots of potential combos that can go very well with ensnare, and since it happens each time you attack, this weapon is actually really powerful. Now, to get the Twisted Oak Crook, you will need to have a level 7 druid use Conjure Woodland Being, and then have the Dryad commit vandalism until they are sent to jail. Once there, they will be disarmed and the Twisted Oak Crook will be in the evidence chest ready for you to loot it. Next up is the Azer Warhammer. This weapon deals an additional 1d6 fire damage on each attack and it also provides the weapon action overheat. This deals 1d10 fire damage in a small AoE around the user and another 1d10 for three turns afterwards, which can really add up for a melee fighter. The Warhammer is also versatile, able to be used as a one or two handed weapon, but what makes this really strong is that it doesn't need a short or long rest to refresh. You can use overheat every single turn for just the cost of a bonus action. To get the Azer Warhammer, you will need to cast the spell Conjure Minor Elemental and select Azer. From there, to get this weapon, you'll need to, of course, have the summon commit vandalism until a guard confronts it and then select Acquiesce and go to prison. When you do, the weapon will be found in the evidence chest, able to be looted and 
used by your party. And next up is the Flail of the Vortex. This flail is really quite strong, my second favorite, granting you Electrified Flail, which will deal 1d10 lightning damage, but also stun your target for two turns. This is quite strong because the stunned target will skip their turn, and you can use this action each turn, more than once even. So you could keep a target stunned repeatedly with this attack. And you know, there is no attack animation for Electrified Flail because you're not supposed to be able to have it as a weapon. So it does look odd. To get this weapon, you'll need the summon to commit vandalism until a guard confronts it. You can then select Acquiesce and go to prison. When you do, the weapon can be found in the evidence chest, able to be looted and used by your party. And last is the Trident of the Depths. This cool looking trident gives the Hymal Strike weapon action. This deals 1d10 frost damage and applies Chilled. What's neat about Chilled is that if the target becomes wet, then they become frozen and vulnerable to force, thunder, and bludgeoning damage. Eldritch Blast being force damage, so I could maybe see a team of Storm Cleric and Eldritch Blast Sorlock wailing on wet and frozen enemies for double damage, and maybe the Trident of the Depths fits in there to help apply those conditions. To get this weapon, you'll need to have the summon commit vandalism until the guard confronts it, and then acquiesce and go to prison, and when you do, you will find the Trident of the Depths in the evidence chest, able to be looted by your party. And finally, number three, we have a spell in Baldur's Gate 3 that can be cast either as a spell, costing a spell slot, or as a cantrip and only costing an action. That spell is Create or Destroy Water. The spell is quite good, so I was surprised to see you can actually save yourself a spell slot by using the cantrip version, but there is a downside. The water it creates when used as a cantrip only lasts four turns. You'll need to use a spell slot in order to make the water surface permanent. However, considering the spell causes two turns of wet on targets either way, this cantrip version is much better than the spell version unless you desperately need the increased radius by upcasting the spell. I think this makes builds that rely on wet for vulnerability, like Storm Cleric, very powerful and lets them use their spell slots for more important spells. And number four is Jorgarol's Greatsword. This greatsword is actually amazing because of its special weapon action, Colossal Onslaught. This channels your strength to strike all creatures in a line, dealing bonus slashing damage equal to your proficiency bonus. The reason this is really good is because unlike Cleave, there is no maximum number of enemies that can be hit by this. Also, because it deals damage equal to your proficiency bonus, it scales well. And if that wasn't enough, every single hit, Smite, can be used as a reaction. Meaning if you really wanted to, you could pull absolutely ridiculous damage if you have enough spell slots to use on enough enemies getting hit by this action. To get this great sword, you need to loot it from the corpse of Corsair Greyman on Ebon Lake or in the Grimforge. Alternatively, you could purchase it from him too. And this great sword is very easy to miss because if you decide to push Corsair Greymon off the boat when you first encounter him, this sword is lost to the depths of Ebon Lake forever. And number five is Blood Money. This weapon action is found on the Morning Star named Twist of Fortune. Blood Money is an attack that deals an additional five slashing damage per 300 gold the target has. But where this gets insane is when you pickpocket an enemy and place all your gold in their pocket. This can set this attack up to deal absolutely unheard of damage. Just 25,000 gold leads to over 400 bonus damage. With the current pouch trick still working with traders, anyone can get unlimited amounts of gold by changing class at Withers to refresh the trader's inventory and stealing all the trader's gold repeatedly. This makes this weapon action much easier to take advantage of consistently. You can find Twist of Fortune on Garingo Thorm in the Wraithwind Toll House. And next up is Trident of the Waves. This very rare trident creates a water surface around any enemy that is hit and it makes them wet for three turns. This is actually a very interesting weapon that you might want to use on a support class for any type of Tempest Cleric. By getting an enemy wet, they take double damage from cold and lightning, and anytime a character hits an enemy with the Trident of the Waves, they become wet. So it could be a great way to spread that vulnerability. However, the Trident of the Waves does not create water or make the target wet when thrown, which is definitely a real disappointment since it would be great on a thrower to just throw once at each enemy once, then have your Tempest Cleric come in there to chain lightning and clear an entire room. But to get this Trident is actually a bit tricky. You'll need to grab the high security vault number four key from the Water Queen's house in the lower city. From there, you'll need to head to the high security vault located beneath the counting house, which involves opening several locked doors and a vault 
vault that has a password. And once you do, and you have that key, you will find that trident inside high security vault number four. And number six is the Peller Sun Blade. This very rare rapier grants advantage on attacks against undead, and it deals additional radiant damage. It also looks really cool. The blade is well hidden in the depths of Cazador's palace. To get there, you'll need to take the elevator leading to Cazador's dungeon. Once there, take the door on your right, and it just ends abruptly, but you can actually jump or fly one level down, and there you'll find a room with a hidden dirt mound. Now, if you fail the skill check to detect it, you can still dig near the center of the room to find the chest containing Pellerson. And next up is the booze tub. When you first enter the goblin camp, there is a booze tub that when clicked opens up a combined menu. This lets you add poison to the booze tub. And if you do, it will become poisoned and a cutscene will begin where you can lead a toast for the goblins to drink from it. It's pretty satisfying seeing the goblins drink and then perish immediately after. And then you'll be accused of poisoning the booze, but you can pretty easily convince them that it wasn't you. And last at number nine is how to recruit large spiders. When you enter the goblin camp, you can actually sneak into priestess Glut's quarters and you'll find a cage hanging above some weakened floor. By shooting the cage, it will fall and smash open a hole in the floor. If you jump through it and walk through the cave exit, you'll be greeted by two large spiders. By succeeding the following animal handling check, you can convince them to follow you to the door. And then if you pull the lever, the spiders will emerge from the cage and begin attacking the goblins. And you don't even need to enter combat. You can just silently walk away. 